Well, we're in Acts chapter 11, as I mentioned. I'm going to be studying with you verses 1 through 30. Before we get into the text, though, I wanted to share this week I received a very kind and complimentary email from a Christian. I've never met him. He lives on the opposite side of the country, but he was just offering me some encouragement and thanking the Lord for this community of faith here in Windsor. And as I replied to him, I thanked him for his his kindness, and I mentioned to him that one of my delights over the last three years or so is having met so many faithful Christians that I otherwise wouldn't have met across our country. And it's a great reminder that while there are many people seated in this room today, that the Church of Jesus Christ is a universal phenomenon. And we wish it was bigger, but it's still pretty big. And God is working in various communities across our country. And there's something beautiful about the Christian church. And then I think about my ministry here closer to home, uh, having had the privilege of pastoring this church now for 22 years. And all of the stories I could tell of lives that have been changed, people who have been an encouragement to me, discipleship relationships. Yesterday when I was... um at the wedding, I was talking to some young people in our church. And I was just encouraged that they, they get it, that they, they understand the nature of relationships and their commitment to Christ. And that just encouraged my heart to listen to them testify. We have people in our church that have been saved for a long time that just faithfully serve. They're like the Energizer Bunny. They just keep going and going and going and going. And it's a delight to see people serve. I mean, it's cool to watch a sprint, but it's also pretty neat to watch people run the marathon, the long distance Christians who just faithfully serve the Lord. And then I know you all find great delight and joy in seeing new Christians come to faith in Christ and witnessing their testimonies uh, in baptismal services or hearing them testify to the Lord. Now, the church isn't perfect. We understand that. The church has many blemishes. I have blemishes. You have blemishes. The church is not perfect. But it's still a beautiful thing that God has designed for us to live out our faith in. It's a beautiful thing to be part of. But in order for us to retain and maintain that beauty, we have to make sure we maintain and retain our fundamental commitments. Because you've studied history enough to know that all of the churches mentioned in the New Testament eventually folded up. At some point, it may last for 50 years, hundreds of years, but every church, generation by generation, must, must recommit itself to the basics of the Christian faith, or it will eventually dishonor the Lord and close its doors. So what are some of the most basic commitments that we need to make as a church to stay on track? Acts chapter 11 verses 1 to 30, introduce us to three basic priorities. This is a basic sermon. Three points. Three basic priorities that help us to stay focused and clear-minded in our mission. What are we about? There's a lot of stuff that happens in our church. But what purposes are we ultimately serving? Well, here are three pretty big ones that we want to remind ourselves of regularly. Here they are. We preach the truth, we evangelize widely, and we provide for one another. And if we can retain those three things, the heart of our church, the Lord will use us mightily. We preach the truth, we evangelize widely, and we meet one another's needs. Let's start with the first one. We preach the truth. So as we enter into Acts chapter 11, Peter if you recall in chapters 9 and 10, had some issues, we could say. He wasn't particularly interested in evangelizing Gentiles. He was a product of his own culture. He'd been taught to steer clear of those unclean Gentiles. But God was moving mightily. And under the new covenant, he was bringing in en masse Gentile believers. And he wanted to use faithful men like Peter to be part of that evangelistic process. But Peter had some hangups. He felt uncomfortable. So God had to teach him how to love Gentiles, how to accept them, how to minister to them. And so he's invited to the home of Cornelius the centurion. And Cornelius becomes a convert to Christianity. 
So Peter overcame his roadblocks, his stigma, you might say, to evangelizing others, but not all Christians had quite gotten there. So as we enter into Acts chapter 11, what we're going to see is that there were certain Christians, Jewish Christians, in Jerusalem that had yet to get it, that had yet to realize that they were responsible to reach the nations. And in particular, among these Jewish Christians, there was a group called the Circumcision Party. Kind of a weird name, really. Can you imagine starting a political party, calling it the Circumcision Party? But back in the first century, that wasn't abnormal language. If you were Jewish, one of the unique things about the Jews is they circumcised their sons as a sign and seal of being under the old covenant. And the reason why they chose circumcision is because their forebear, Abraham, received what was called a seed promise that God would multiply his physical descendants for generations to come. So they would talk about the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Makes us feel a little uncomfortable, but that's how it worked in the first century. And the circumcision party were, were a group within the early Christians that felt that, yes, salvation is by grace through faith alone, but then they were contradicting that by requiring circumcision to be part of the Christian church. So with that in mind, these legalists trying to impose laws upon early Christians hear from Peter and they have a conversation with him and express some of their concerns. Here's what the text says. Now the apostles and brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. The natural response of which should be what? Hallelujah. Praise God. People are getting saved. But that's not the initial response. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Like, we don't do that. Now, go easy on them a little bit because Peter, not too much earlier than this, had the exact same hangups. But nevertheless, we're learning here that when people came to Christ, they were accepted by Christ regardless of their ethnic background, regardless of their heritage, regardless of their past sins, that the gospel of Jesus Christ in that sense was truly inclusive. Here we have people coming to Christ, but the greatest concern with the circumcision party is optics, the perception of compromise. Now later, by the way, while Peter is going to correct them very graciously, later in uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 12, Peter fell backward into his old way of thinking. So several years had gone by, and he was a people pleaser, which is a sin that all of us need to be aware of. You might be extreme in that area. You might think you're not a people pleaser at all. Every one of us is a people pleaser. Every one of us on some level is concerned about what other people think. And it can be a real besetting sin for some or just a Little bitty sin in other people's lives, but were easily influenced by other people's opinions. And Peter had slipped backwards and he was now distancing himself from Gentile converts. And Paul had to confront him in the book of Galatians for this sin brought about by what we call the Judaizers or the circumcision party. Now, just to add to that a little bit, if you've ever read the book of Galatians, you'll know that in the eighth verse, of the first chapter, Galatians 1.8, there's a very blunt statement made there by Paul. He says to the Galatian churches, if anyone preaches a gospel to you other than the one we delivered to you, let him be anathema. That's the Greek word. That means let him be eternally damned. That's pretty hardcore. But it's a great reminder to us that we cannot mess with the gospel of grace by adding to it or subtracting from it. So Peter needs to correct the circumcision party. So with God's message to him fresh in his mind, he then recounts what we already read in chapter 10. But it's worth repeating because it's easy to forget. 
But Peter began and explained to them in order. So he gives a very orderly and accurate account. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and birds of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. Now, you know, but just to remind ourselves what that was about, if you were in church last Sunday, God is changing the dietary laws for the Jews under the new covenant. They had symbolized cleanliness and uncleanliness. Now he's removing that. He's opening a new opportunity to sort of eat what you want. And the reason why we learn in Acts chapter 10, God instructs Peter in this way. The idea is if, if Peter can wrap his mind around the fact that the rules are changing in terms of his relationship to food, That's the lesser lesson. The greater lesson is easier to, pardon the pun, digest. And the greater lesson is his relationship was also going to be changing with regard to Jews and Gentiles. So using the lesser, he's going to prepare Peter for even greater change. So he receives this vision and then In verse 10, we're told this happened three times, drawn up into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea by Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction, which was a massive cultural and religious hurdle for him to overcome. These six brothers also accompanied me. And we entered the man's house and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And I began to preach and the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. How he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Now bear in mind, not too much before this, Peter wouldn't have been able to preach that message. But he had experienced God's grace in his own life, and God had instructed him in terms of his conduct and relationship to others. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is not an ethnocentric gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a gospel for one nationality. Some religions in our world are very specific. The the foundation... And the vast majority of adherents to their religion come from one or two or at least a select region of ethnic groups. But the gospel of Jesus Christ was intended to be a gospel for the whole world, both Jews and Gentiles. God can save anyone. He can save anyone. Our job is not to pick and choose who we think he might be in the process of saving but to faithfully proclaim the gospel and allow God to do what only God can do, which is bring about true repentance and conversion. Well, here's their response. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then the Gentiles, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And by the way, there is no life apart from repentance. Now, this is the best possible response we could hope for. They contemplate it. They're silent. They accept it. 
They acknowledge the truth of this and then they praise God for it. And so should we, brothers and sisters. We should be super thankful when anyone comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should anticipate that some of the people that we least expect will come to faith, may not come to faith in Jesus Christ, will come to faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the opposite is also true. You ever meet people that are just really nice, really good, but they're still sinners? And you share the gospel with them, and I don't need it. My life's fine. You know, I got money in the bank. I got a married. I'm married. I got kids. I can think of someone that I have sought to share the gospel with over the years so many times. They just don't think they need it. And they're pretty clean living people overall. The gospel can save people like that, but the wonderful thing is the gospel also saved people like Saul, who was on a mission to put Christians to death. And God just arrested him before he could arrest them by his grace and miraculously converted him. So let's make a concerted effort to share Christ even with people outside of our comfort zones. And to clarify, if there's any attempt to add to the gospel, to add rules, to add regulations to the gospel that are not true to the gospel, we need to confront that. Now, that doesn't mean that you can get saved and then just live however you want. There are rules. There are do's and don'ts to a properly ordered society, to a properly ordered marriage, to a properly ordered home, to a properly ordered life. There's things you shouldn't say and there's things you should say. There's places you should go and there's places you shouldn't go. But these are not effectual in saving you, but they are responses to a life that is committed to holiness. So we preach the truth, especially when there's any ambiguity in the area of salvation. Secondly, we evangelize widely. Now listen to this very interesting series of events that takes place. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, remember Stephen, the first Christian martyr? The Jews were desperate to extinguish Christianity as early as possible, and Saul had been part of that. Christians have been scattered. They've been run out of Jerusalem. They traveled as far as Phoenicia, which is a Gentile area, Cyprus, also Gentile, and Antioch, which is also Gentile, But listen to this, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Why? Because in each of these Gentile cities, there were Jewish contingents. Now, there is an interesting phenomenon that I think we're seeing in this text. And it relates to our comfort zones. It happens in Canada. People come here from other countries. Probably most of us came here at some point from from other countries, or at least our forebears did. And you set foot in a new world, and you look around, and what do you look for? You look for people that are like you. And what do we do? We, We establish churches, and we put the name of an ethnicity on it, which, by the way, I think is a massive mistake. When you put an ethnicity on a sign, it's it's very exclusionary, and it's not... It doesn't demonstrate, it doesn't show that you understand the universal nature of the Christian church. Now, you got to pick a language to preach in and whatnot, but to put the, an ethnicity on a sign, I think that's a massive mistake. And those, those names need to be taken off of churches forthwith because the gospel is inclusive in this respect. But when they went to Phoenicia, which is a gent, most people there are Gentiles. Who did they preach Christ to? Jews. When they went to Cyprus, which is largely Gentile, who did they preach Christ to? Jews, when they went to Antioch, which is a Gentile city with a Jewish minority, who do they preach Christ to? They preach Christ to the Jews. And we need to be careful of that. That when God calls us to preach, we don't just look for people that are kind of like us and preach to them. Now, that's it's, it's a good thing to do, but they needed to be taught to also see the Gentiles around them. I also want to note this point. Isn't it interesting that God does use them to bring the gospel to far off cities, even as a result of persecution? 
You see, one of the things we know about the devil, he always overplays his hand. Always. Always overplays his hand. What happens when churches are attacked, when churches are burned, when Christians are persecuted? Well, there's this separation of the wheat from the chaff, the the fakes bail out. But those that are truly part of Christ's bride, the church always grows. People are always galvanized. The church always expands. You run people out of one town, they just go and preach the gospel in the next. And it's happened time and time and time again through human history. So in that respect, while we don't cherish persecution, we do know that it's a great example of the fact that God says all things work together for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. God always wins. The devil's a loser. And he loses every single time. And nothing will stop the church of Jesus Christ from spreading farther and farther and farther until the Lord Jesus returns. That's a good thing to be reminded of. So there's a bit of persecution going on here. And then we have this statement in verse 20. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. Who are the Hellenists? The Greeks, the Gentiles. It's another word for Gentile. So they understood we got to preach to them as well. Preaching the Lord Jesus And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord, and the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And so they rightly sent Barnabas to Antioch. It's like, we gotta, we gotta bring some fresh recruits up. We got a lot of people to disciple. We're gonna send Barnabas up to do some ministry in Antioch. And he came and saw the grace of God, and he was glad as should we be when there are conversions to Christ? And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. I want to make this comment to new believers. When Barnabas shows up in Antioch, I mean, he probably preached a whole bunch of things. We didn't know what his first statement was or his second or third. But what we have here in the word of God is the summary of his sermon. And what, out of all the things he could have picked from the word of God to preach to these new believers, what did, he, what did he focus in on? Remain faithful and remain steadfast. I think that is probably one of the most important lessons that needs to be taught to new disciples in Jesus Christ. So if you're a mature believer and you're discipling younger believers, if you're discipling your children, others that have come to faith in Christ, There are, there is a lot of temptation to backslide. Have you noticed that? There's a lot of temptation to throw in the towel, to become discouraged. And I've noticed, this is just anecdotal, but I, I see some patterns like this in scripture. I've noticed time and time again, people that come to faith in Christ and the first year and the second year and third year aren't so bad. But around that third year, okay, you're, you're kind of like finishing your apprenticeship now, finishing your degree, so to speak. And that's when the pressure often begins to mount because you realize, oh, the church isn't as pure as I thought it was. And the Christian life is more difficult than I thought it was. And God hasn't necessarily taken all of my challenges or my sinful inclinations away yet. And you got a choice to make. Isn't it interesting that um, in the word of God, after three years of intense ministry, we have two disciples that totally fumble the ball. Peter and Judas. Now, Peter is outed as a false convert. And sometimes persecution and trial and suffering outs the false converts. Judas is a false convert, but Peter is a true convert. He's a true convert. But he also denies Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. And when he fails the Lord, and it's embarrassing and it's shameful, instead of going to the religious authorities like Judas did, Peter has an encounter with the living Christ. And Christ presses him through a series of questions. Do you really love me? Feed my sheep. Do you really love me? Presses him on the seashore. And that really is, I believe, Peter's restoration to ministry. Now, was Peter perfect from there on? No, but he was tested at the three-year mark. Judas was tested at the three-year mark. You very 
very well might be tested in and around the three-year mark. And my encouragement to you is don't give up. Remain faithful. Be steadfast. Persevere. Persevere. Stick with it. The winds are going to blow as we sang. The rain is going to pound down on your house. But if you are founded on the rock of Jesus Christ, persevere, push forward, do not give up, never surrender. And God will bless you. And you'll continue to mature in the Christian faith. Well, verse 24 says, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Now, if you remember, Saul coming into Damascus is, has this dramatic encounter with Christ. He becomes a believer. He's brought into Damascus. He then starts to preach. That raises the ire of his opponents. He's threatened with death. His opponents lower him over the wall in a basket. He escapes back to Jerusalem. He's not regarded super well in Jerusalem. They're kind of wary of this guy. Eventually he's accepted, preaches in Jerusalem, and they're after him again. So then his disciples say, look, it's probably best you get on a boat and head back up to Tarsus, which is in Gentile territory, had a Jewish population. So he heads back to his home territory and some time has passed. And they're like, we need Saul. We need Saul to come and help in, in Antioch. So when they had found him, they, they brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, the first short-term mission trip, for a whole year, they went with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, Antioch was in Syria, north of Jerusalem, south of Tarsus, and there was a sizable Jewish community there, which made it easy for Jews to naturally strike up conversations with Jews. But also we've already read that many Gentiles had come to faith in Christ. So they needed to build up a bit of a team. In other words, they actually were strategic. You know, I hear a lot of pastors, oh, we're not into strategy. It's like, as soon as you plan anything, oh, you're a pragmatist. Well, there's room for some pragmatic reflection, folks. If there's X number of new disciples and they need to be discipled, you need to send people <laughs> to do the job, for example. You need to be strategic in that regard. And I, I would just say a lot of churches struggle with growth because they're not strategic at all. They just assume that God's going to just take care of everything when God here has a great example for us of a, a bit of strategy, a bit of thoughtfulness. So they bring in Paul, also known as Saul, and it's because they, they realize we need to invest. We need to invest in these Gentile converts. Barnabas knows that he cannot do it alone. You need to know what your limits are, by the way, as well. When to ask for help. Saul had had a little bit of time in Tarsus to presumably, I'm sure he wasn't just sitting on his hands, study the word of God, grow in his understanding of the word of God. And now he, he's, he receives this soft commissioning by Barnabas and some of these early disciples to begin what would later be known as Paul's first missionary journey. And we know, having read the rest of the New Testament, that he would become the most important early Christian figure to reach Gentile people for Christ, was instrumental in planting all sorts of churches throughout Asia Minor. This was his first kick at the can, so to speak. And I love the fact that one of the things that these believers demonstrate is they are willing to relocate anywhere to reach people for Christ. It's comfortable living in one place, being in the same location forever. And for some, that's your calling. But for others, how many of us, if the Lord called us to go to some unreached community, would say, okay, you want me to go, I'll go? Or would we put stipulations on it? Can I bring my grandkids? <laughs> what would be the stipulations that you might place on it? 
a Christian would say, no, you want me to go, Lord? I'll go. Now, in Acts chapter 9, these early Christians kind of had this nebulous title applied to them. They were called followers of the way. Now, that's a Christian concept. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But it's not particularly helpful for describing who they actually were. That language appears again, I think, in the 19th chapter and at some point in the in the 20s of this book, maybe 21 or 22. But they've been called the way, but here they are called something more specific that identifies them even more clearly. They're called Christians. That's actually a direct transliteration, letter for letter, from the Greek into the English. The Greek word is Christinus. The us is just showing that it's a direct object. But the word Christian is directly from the Greek. And it denounces or it denotes the fact that we, our, our fundamental identity is in Christ himself. The text also says the disciples were first called. Now that word is, is interesting. Because the word called can mean, hey, I'm calling out. Or oh, we're, just refer, we're referring to them as Christians. But it's a little more... A little more aggressive than that. The word, like the literal meaning of that word is they first transacted business as Christians. They first transacted business as Christians. That's the literal meaning of that Greek word. But in context, what that means, what that means is it was at Antioch that they first publicly became known as Christians. In other words, they ran the flag up the flagpole. It became super public that this was their new identity. And they don't hide it. They're Christians. They're comfortable with having the word Christ in the label that's been developed to apply to them. Now, we, we've done a great job in our culture in trying to mask Christ from culture. And even Christian churches fall into this. Do you want to hear one of my pet peeves? Who here wants to hear one of my pet peeves? Okay. I know you're all eagerly waiting euphemistic language, where people say things like, oh, you're faith-based. No, I'm a Christian. Oh, you pastor a faith-based organization. No, it's a Christian church. Oh, you're, you're a man of God, a religious leader, a clergyman. No, I'm a Christian. And increasingly, especially in an anti-Christian culture, we need to be comfortable calling ourselves Christians. We are Christians. Not religious people, this is not churchgoers, faith-based, whatever it might be. No, we are Christians, and we emphasize that because the center of our message is Christ, not just some nebulous faith or some set of religious facts. It's Christ. Christ is at the center of history, is at the center of our message. So we call ourselves Christians. By the way, it takes some bravery to call yourself a Christian these days. If you want to be applauded or promoted, call yourself an atheist. Oh, it's cool and hip to be an atheist. People will assume you're actually an intellectual if you're an atheist. Actually, the Bible says you're a fool. The fool says in his heart there is no God. But notice how we flip everything backwards on its head. Oh, the the smart people are atheists. That's the logical conclusion of studying the world. No, that means you're a fool. Oh, I'm a new age spiritualist. I just love spiritual stuff. Extract a few teachings from Buddha and Krishna and this religion and that. Throw a little Jesus into the mix. I'm a spiritualist. Oh, that's cool, man. You're cool. But what if you say I'm a Christian? Huh. That's not so cool. This week I was called a fundamentalist. Now, the word in of itself isn't a bad word, but I know what it means in culture. You're an extremist. You're a weirdo. Actually, you're a weirdo. <laughs> you're a fool. Because the fool says in his heart, there's no God. Well, why does the fool even concern himself with religious things if there's no God? Why is it that every person lives under some sort of religious categories if there is no God? 
They called themselves Christians, and it takes bravery to declare, I'm a Christian. I'm not saying that to seek attention, but I am a Christian. So we preach the truth. We evangelize widely, which means we need to know the message of Christ. But you know what it also means? It means we need to be comfortable with our identity in him and not hide it and not bury it. Third, we provide for one another. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit, didn't make it up, by the Spirit, that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. And we know historically there was a famine in that area sometime between the year 45 and 48 AD. So the Lord reveals in advance to one of his choice servants, a prophet, that this is going to happen. So the church just prays and says, "Ah, God, we're going to let go and let God do whatever he wants. Is that what they do? No, they actually plan. They put some strategy in place. They prepare in advance. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now, by the way, when it says here, they came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, you might be looking at a flat map and you're like, oh, that's an error in the Bible. Jerusalem is to the south. Antioch is to the north. They should have said they went up. But in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, it's when it talks about up and down, it's talking about elevation. So Jerusalem is in an elevated position. So if you're standing in Jerusalem, the direction you're going to Antioch is downhill because it's in a lower area. So they're going north, so on a flat map, up, but geographically they're going down to Antioch. The prophecy is given, the people respond. They don't just flub it off and say, well, you know, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, worry not about tomorrow, let tomorrow take care of itself. How do we justify that, by the way? Planning and not worrying. If we plan, if we plan things as a church, does that mean we're worried? Every time we have a strategic idea, hey, you know what? This might happen or this might happen, so we should plan for it. We got a lot of converts. Maybe we should start building up our eldership. Maybe we should start new groups. Oh, that's, that's too much strategy. So when you hear about churches, it's just a free-for-all. There's no leaders. There's no strategy. There's no structure. It's just... We preach, we baptize, we have a prayer meeting, and we just, whatever happens, happens. Well, (laughs) that's a problem. Here they saw there was a problem, and their solution was, bring Saul in. We need more help. Send Barnabas up. We need help. There's going to be a famine. Let's collect money in advance. Joseph did the same thing in Egypt. When God revealed to him there would be a famine, what does he do? Is he say, ah, let go, let God. When it happens, it happens. We don't worry about tomorrow. We just live in the moment. No, he collects food. And actually, it becomes a sort of pre-evangelism opportunity to make contacts with people. Here, they plan ahead. And it's noteworthy, and I think this is super awesome, that the people that are doing the planning and collecting the food are a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles now blessing the mother church back in Judea with physical, tangible help. Isn't that neat? You know what? Many years ago, we had um, in our world a, a missionary movement where people largely from West, what we call Western countries, Christianized countries, went to far off countries in Asia, Africa, South America, China, preached the gospel and established churches. And why did they do that? Because they had a lot of Christians. You know what we're starting to hear rumblings of? Some of those people that came to faith in Christ coming here to evangelize us because much of the Western church has lost its way. I've been told that the greatest missionary sending church in the world right now is South Korea, sending out all kinds of missionaries. 
even to the West, to, to re-evangelize the West. Well, we, something similar is going on here to do with food items, obviously, but initially the, the church in Jerusalem was a little resistant, but finally they understood the full gospel. They send Barnabas, Saul's there, people get saved, and lo and behold, they eventually benefit from it. It's pretty cool to see how God uses networks to reach people and to build up his church. So we see here in this text, breaking down of barriers, continue to be the, the, the Gentile Jewish divide continues to be broken down. Uh, Christians committing themselves to tangibly helping one another and planning in advance to help one another. They had one another's back and they met each other's needs. They preached the gospel, but they also met physical needs. Unless you're a dualist, who sort of despises the physical and just focuses on the spiritual, you'll know that God has made us both physical and spiritual. We live in both a physical and spiritual world, and we help each other physically, and we help each other spiritually. That's the Christian thing to do. Not one or the other, but we help each other physically, and we help each other spiritually. Now, in terms of strategy, let's talk about strategy for a moment. You hear someone who needs groceries, what do you do? You go buy some groceries and you help them out. Let's say you're having a conversation with them and you discover that they're hardworking people and just something out of the blue happened and they just needed a helping hand. You meet the need. But if you're having a conversation with them and you discover this has been an ongoing issue, well, wouldn't it be strategic to say, hey, I'd like to help you figure out how to solve this problem once and for all. So if it's a, maybe they don't know how to apply for a job, teach them how to write a resume, help them to understand a Christian view of, of work, uh, help them to reorganize their lives so that they can provide for themselves and provide for their families. And then how about as a church? What can we do as a church? Well, one of the things we ask people to consider is to be in a small group in the church. I can't possibly meet all your needs directly. I don't even know what most of your needs are. I have a general idea, but I don't know what goes on in all of your lives. It's close to 1,500 people that identify with this church. So we put people in small groups, and in that small group, your small group is going to know about the challenges you're having, and they can be the ones that meet your needs, or you can keep your ears open for needs that you can meet. So that's a strategic way of making sure people don't spiral down into a very dark place. You meet people's needs as you go. And I don't need to know about that. And the church doesn't need to know about that. And you don't have our need to have our permission to meet people's needs. Just go meet people's needs. And then as a church, you know, we know we, we there's been a lot of conversation. We don't know what the future holds, but there's been a lot of conversation in our culture over the last little while about skyrocketing food prices. Well, here's a small solution. Why don't we teach people to garden more, to grow some of their own food, to Maybe you can't grow everything that you would eat, but maybe this person grows this and you grow that and you create networks where you're, you're meeting each other's needs. Doesn't mean you're worried about tomorrow. We're not worried about anything. We trust in the Lord, but we don't exclude strategic thinking. If we knew there's going to be a food shortage, why wouldn't we start stocking up on food? It doesn't mean that we stockpile it and make that our idol and put all our security in that. But the point is, is brothers and sisters, it's okay to be strategic and still be a Christian. It's okay to mutually share and think through, you know, how can we more effectively, instead of just putting band-aids on things, here's a bag of food, here's a bag of food, here's a bag of food, help people to understand how to think Christianly about their economics. Help people to learn how to grow their own food. Help people to learn how to create networks where they can share their food these are just wise things that I think more Christians should, should consider. And we do this for the purpose of blessing and building each other up. So we preach the truth, we evangelize widely, and we meet each other's needs. As I mentioned at the beginning of this message, we really are only about one generation or so away from seeing this place close its doors. If we don't stay focused, it doesn't take very long for a church to spiral down into nothingness. 
In fact, don't you find it like super sad that we live in a country that historically built churches from coast to coast? And many of those churches are more anti-Christ than the government itself. And many of these, many of these denominations that have abandoned the gospel, they're, they're empty buildings. They think they're going to bring people in by being flaky and fluffy and low calorie in their preaching. And the result is everyone cheers and claps. And over time, nobody comes because they don't care. If you don't have a transformational message to preach, why bother getting out of bed on Sunday morning and going to church? And unfortunately, a lot of these historic denominations and associations, how are they funding themselves? They're just selling off property that previous generations of Christians worked for and tithed into, selling off property to real estate developments, to mosques, to recreational facilities, just to fund the pension plans of the very men and women that wrecked the denomination in the first place. It's sad and it's disgusting. But there's a lesson there for us. We can so easily get off track. If we allow legalism to trump grace, we stop evangelizing and we stop meeting people's needs. Now, all of us have, I would say, a comfort zone. Let me just end with this. Here we are in church. Chances are, unless you're a hyper introvert or you're a reporter, in the church this morning, you're probably going to stick around afterwards and you're going to chat with a few people. And the natural tendency is you're going to chat with people that are in your small group. Or you're going to chat with your relatives. Or you're going to chat with people you've known for a while. Or you're going to chat with people that sort of somehow have some affinity to you. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But... Let me just ask you this. How is it possible that we can expect to be prepared to go out these doors and reach people that aren't Christians, don't act like us, think like us, maybe come from a different country, if we can't even be inclusive in our own church? So when you come to church, here's an idea. Spend some time approaching and dialoguing and chatting with people that aren't like you, that you've never met before. So this is uncomfortable. Well, if you can't get it here, you're not going to get it out there. So the wonderful thing about being in a diverse church is it's a great, it's a great way of being stretched. It's a great way of learning to interact with people that in, in the normal rhythms of life in society, we wouldn't normally approach or have a conversation with people that are way older than us, people that are way younger than us, people from different countries, people of different backgrounds. This is a great place to, to put it into practice. Who here is feeling a little uncomfortable? It's good. If you can't be uncomfortable here, you're not going to be uncomfortable out there. Now, you could beeline it for me, the pastor. I'm going to go talk to the pastor. I feel comfortable with him. Or you can beeline it for your small group. Or you could beeline it for people you've never met before. And I have a sneaky suspicion you'll also enjoy it and be blessed by it as you expand your circle of influence in your friend group. So let's keep these things in mind. Let's choose not to drift. Let's choose to individually value truth, value evangelism and value providing for others. This is all part of the beauty of Christ's bride.